Stanford University. Hi, so my name is Kirsten Loita. I'm a senior licensing associate at Stanford's Office of Technology Licensing. I've been with the office for 15 years now, um, and I'm going to be talking today about Stanford's intellectual property policies, how we do technology transfer at the university, and then talk a little bit about TechFinder and finding technologies at Stanford that people in this course may want to work on. So there are many different ways that technology transfer happens from universities to industry. Obviously, one is through the students that come through the university. Um, all of you are students at the university. Someday you may be working in industry. And so the things that you learn at the university are something that you may be taking with you to industry. The publications that are produced uh, by the students, faculty, research associates, et cetera, at the university also are a mechanism of technology transfer. Any seminars or conferences that you give about what, uh, what it, the work is that you're doing at the university also are ways that uh, technology transfer can happen. Uh, consulting, a lot of people at the university do like to consult with industry, so that's another mechanism for transfer of technology. We also have industrial sponsored research uh, at the university where industry sponsors certain projects at the university. And there are the industrial affiliate programs, uh, which are programs through which industry uh, usually has some sort of fees that they pay to uh, have a closer affiliation with certain uh, sectors of the university. And then there's the um, particular part that I deal with, which is intellectual property created at the university and licensing of that intellectual property. The Office of Technology Licensing, our mission is to promote the transfer of Stanford technology for society's use and benefit while generating unrestricted income to support research and education. So it's a twofold mission as we see it. Uh, we want to have the technologies created at the university go out, actually benefit people, make products um, that uh, help people with their lives, and at the same time, have income back to the university, then supporting further research, which would then pensions at the university. This is kind of seen as a cycle, is that um, intellectual property is generated, we license that out to companies, the companies then develop products. From those products, we then receive royalties for the sales of those products, that those royalties come in, and we then uh, use those royalties to support further research, which hopefully would generate further IP. The main type of um, intellectual property that we deal with uh, in our office is patents, um, but we also have other types of IP, such as copyrightable material, in particular software, but they also can be um, other types of copyrightable material, material such as um, educational works, etc., and also biological material. We do a lot of licensing of biological material, which is often cell lines, monoclonal antibodies, uh, knockout mice, things like that. The ownership policy is something that we get a lot of questions about at the university. The ownership policy at Stanford is that the university takes title to all inventions created with more than incidental use of university resources. Um, the key phrase there obviously is incidental use. What does incidental use mean? Um, and that is something that if there is a question about what what incidental use is, um, you can come and ask us whether something would be considered incidental use or not. If you're using a computer here and there on campus, that would be considered incidental. If you are using a lab full time, etc., that would be more than incidental use. But if you have any questions about that, do come and see us. My next slide is a list of notable inventions at Stanford. Um, our office was established 40, almost 42 years ago now, in 1970. Uh, the first notable invention you'll see on our list is FM sound synthesis, which was a um, method of uh, making computer-generated music. This was used in a lot of the synthesizers, um, particularly made by Yamaha in the 1980s. You'll see that there's a variety of inventions here in all different disciplines. The next one is the recombinant DNA cloning technology from Stanley Cohen and Herbert Boyer. Um, that was licensed to over 400 companies during the lifetime of that particular patent um, and uh, was for a long time the largest income producing in, uh, technology at, at Stanford. 
Um, you'll see in 1981, um, there are a number of different technologies, all in different areas. Uh, Phycobilly proteins, obviously from the life sciences area, fiber op optic amplifier, which was a long program that we had with Lytton, uh, now Northrop Grumman. Um, to create uh, these fiber optic amplifiers. And then Minos, which is a software program that we still have a lot of licenses to. So a lot of different technologies just from that one year um, that have generated uh, significant income for the university. Um, our current uh, largest uh, money maker actually is this functional antibodies technology from uh, Vernonoy, Len Herzenberg, and Sherry Morrison. Um, that technology, the patent uh, expires in 2015, so it's still generating income for the university. Uh, you'll see um, under 1990 to 1992, we had a number of technologies that were used in the DSL standards. And um, our current largest moneymaker um, for the university actually was the PageRank algorithm from Google, and that's because we had uh, received equity in, in part um, through our license to Google for the PageRank algorithm. Um, however, uh, the functional antibodies technology likely will surpass actually that income uh, in the coming year or two. And you'll notice that there's this large gap. Um, so our last uh, big invention, a uh, notable uh, big invention was from 1996, and that was the PageRank algorithm. There's a large gap between that and now, and that's because most university technologies are very nascent. They're very early stage, and it takes a long time for technologies to um, catch up perhaps to where industry is at. So we're hoping to figure out what the next big thing is coming up, and maybe some of you can help us with that. This next slide is about um, tells about how what what kind of our stream of inventions is and what happens with those invention. We typically receive about eight new invention disclosures per week, so between 400 and 500 new invention disclosures per year. We start the filing of the patent we start the patent application process on about uh, half of those. And then um, some of those we actually don't file as patent applications because they can be licensed otherwise as biological material or software, as I mentioned, copyrightable works. And so we don't actually usually pursue patenting on those types of inventions because it's not necessarily needed. Other inventions um, we decide um, we're not going to pursue for other various reasons. Um, there's not a much, as much commercial potential for them. Um, there's already a lot of prior art out there. They may be just a very small niche improvement or something like that, and we may not pursue them for those particular reasons. And then at the end of the day, we usually end up licensing between um, a fifth and a quarter of the invention disclosures that we receive. This next slide shows um, the disclosure and licensing history of our office. Again, I, as I mentioned, our office was started in 1970. Uh, during that year, we had 28 invention disclosures. We did a total of three licenses, and we had a royalty income of $50,000 um, and a staff of two people. In 2010, our uh, disclosure numbers were at 457 for the year. Uh, we did um, about 90 licenses. We typically do these days between 80 and 100 licenses per year, new licenses. And our royalty income has been around 65 million for the last three years or so. Our cumulative total now is approaching 9,000 invention disclosures, over 3,000 licenses. We were founded in 1970. And our royalty income is approaching now uh, 1.3, 1.4 a billion dollars in our, this is our total of course over time. Our staff currently is about 35 people. Um, the staff uh, is consists of a number of licensing associates like myself. There are I think nine of us um, and then licensing liaisons who help especially uh, with the marketing aspects of the technologies and then a number of other people in the office uh, doing various functions such as accounting, database management, um, just really help keep our office going. The next section of my talk is going to be about actually where you can find out more information about um, our office as well as technologies from our office. So this is our website, uh, otl.stanford.edu. The main portion of the website, you can actually find parts of the presentation that I uh, just uh, have given right now. You'll see that there's a, a four inventors part right here. So inventors part right here, 
And under that, you can find uh, information about uh, disclosures. There's also a part that says for industry. And under that, you can actually find our standard license agreements. So if you ever have an interest in just looking at what a license agreement would look like, um, that's under the resources part right here. And then down at the bottom, you'll see um, Tech Finder, and that's the next thing I was going to speak about, where you can learn more about technologies that are available from Stanford for licensing. And if you have an interest in doing a project on a technology from Stanford, you can find that there. This is Tech Finder. On Tech Finder, you can uh, search for technologies in a lot of different ways. Um, one is that uh, you can go just to the basic search box up here at the top. Um, that you could just put in whatever you're interested in and, uh, and find technologies that way. Uh, another way that you can do it is you could look up keywords. There's a section right here that says all keywords and you could just see what kind of keywords there are. And if there's a particular type of keyword, you can just look under there and see what technologies are listed. Um, but the way that I mainly recommend using TechFinder is by using the advanced search um, option. So if you click on advanced search, um, you'll come to this page, which shows you um, a different, a bunch of different boxes which you can fill in with your, with your interests. And particularly, you can look up things uh, by different things that you might be interested in. Uh, you could look things up by the inventor name. Um, if you have a particular researcher that you're interested in, you could also, uh, again, put in your particular keywords here. Um, your keyword, instead of having to look it up through the list, you could actually just look it up um, here and see if there's a particular invention. Another thing that um, I think is uh, particularly good is instead of searching by keyword, you can use the um, abstract application and this contains, you know, something that you might be interested in that you might be able to uh, look up something there. Inventions that are from lots of different areas. I have a golf swing invention right now. Um, I have a lot of the life science inventions, um, particular therapeutics or diagnostics that could be of, interesting, of interest, sequencing types of inventions. Also a lot of software and also very practical types of inventions that may be more of a product type of um, uh, technology that you may be interested in. Questions about uh, inventions and th think technologies that we may have, intellectual property policies at Stanford, please do feel free to contact us. You can contact me at the email address that was at the beginning of this presentation, um, or you can use the numbers that are otherwise on this presentation. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.